Well, Hatcher, I think everybody in this room at least knows this. He's been a long-time friend of mine. He's a faithful gospel preacher. Been with us on these lectures, I think, from the very beginning. Second one, I couldn't remember. He uh, is in Pensacola, Florida, where he was born a long, long time ago. Uh, <laughs> he's the son of a gospel preacher, married to Karen, who we appreciate very much for putting up with him and making Dr. Pecker floats. That's, uh, she's, she's very good there, as you can tell by Michael. Well, we'll go over that. So they have two sons. He's uh, done a lot of work in Texas, in Oklahoma, Arkansas. And as I say again, he's presently working with the Bellevue Church of Christ, Pensacola, Florida. Been a number of lectureships, gospel meetings, spoken to various groups, done radio and television work, taught in various schools, and he is the editor of the um, of Defender and Beacon, the Bellevue Lecture Book. He's done a tremendous amount of work in those areas, and he has also debated a uh, mutual friend of ours, uh, Bob L. Ross, or as we call him, Bob L. Ross. And uh, if he's listening, then please know that uh, he's had enough of us, and that's enough. <laughs> we don't want to take any more time uh, away from Michael. He'll be speaking on worship and unity. So let's uh, listen to Brother Michael present this lesson. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Always enjoy staying with Jody. And David's around too, but... Uh, <laughs> I enjoy staying with David and Jody. They are, their hospitality is very much appreciated. Uh, we enjoy each other's company. And appreciate this congregation and all that this congregation means, the work that they do, the elders of this congregation and overseeing them. One of my elders came this year. They, maybe they're deciding they can't let uh, me out of their sight too much. They have to make sure that I actually come and all of that. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> worship and unity. God placed within man the need to worship, even as the need to breathe, the need to eat, uh, the need for other things. There's the need to worship, and so you find universally man worshiping. It's not always the right one, right object, but you find man worshiping. When we look at it from a biblical standpoint, Genesis 4th chapter, you start saying man worshiping with uh, Cain and Abel. <clears throat> one of them was in unity and union with God, while the other one was not. And so we see both from the aspect of true worship and false worship in that worship. But man was worshiping. Of course, Abel offered a, an acceptable sacrifice to God and thus was in unity with God. Cain's was not. Cain's was not accepted to God. And so we start seeing that aspect of unity in worship. But what is worship? And I know that many will define unity during this week, so I'm just going to skip over that. There's a section in the book if you want to read it, but um, worship is from a Middle English word which means worthiness and respect. It's defined by Webster as reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power, also an act of expressing such reverence. The Old Testament word for worship basically it carries the idea of the, to bow down or prostrate oneself. 
It was a posture, again, which indicated reverence toward that one who was considered superior to the self or the individual doing it. The main New Testament word means literally to kiss toward. And again, it expresses an attitude or a gesture of one's complete dependence on or submission to a higher authority figure, a falling down and worship, to do obeisance, to prostrate oneself before or do reverence to, according to Arndt, Danker, and Bauer. That's the idea of worship, the idea of expressing and an attitude of reverence and respect toward God. When Jesus was asked about worship by the Samaritan woman in John the fourth chapter, we worship in this mountain, you Jews say in the mount, uh, or in Jerusalem is the place of worship. Jesus teaches us three great principles dealing with worship, and all of them are important in relationship to unity. The first, of course, is that worship must be directed to the Father. The second is that worship must be done with the proper attitude. And third, that worship must be done according to the Word of God. All three of those are important aspects in relationship to our worship. Unity, for there to be true unity, must be, our worship must be directed toward the proper object, which is God. When Israel went down into Egypt, there in Egypt, they had all sorts and all kinds of gods, idols. If Israel over here worshiping the one true God and Egypt worshiping all these idols, they could not have unity unless Israel compromised the truth and went into error or else Egypt left the error and went into truth. Otherwise, there was no true unity. Same thing when Israel went into the promised land. They had all of these nations that were there who had their own gods. And, of course, God said, you destroy those nations utterly. And one of the reasons was to prevent that false object of worship having an influence over you. The problem was they didn't destroy the nations that were there. And what happened? They started compromising the truth of God in relationship to worship to God and started worshiping those idols. Today, we are to worship God the Father. But here's the Muslims over here. They're making inroads within the United States they're, and the world. They worship a false god. God of Mohammedism. Can we, in worshiping God the Father, have unity with them? Think, though, for a minute of denominationalism and the ecumenicalism that prevails denominationalism. Denominationalism comes along and says, well, we're not going to matter what you do in relationship to worship or the plan of salvation, or anything else, as long as you're not exclusive, of course. And we're going to continue to have unity and fellowship, one with another. Then why not, in relationship to the object of worship, have that same attitude? The reality is, there's no way that they can prevent the ecumenicalism that they see within the denominational world with God of all or the God of Muhammad is. There's no way they can prevent it, logically. Now, they're going to come along and say, oh, no, we're not going to do that. But they've already given up. 
They've already submitted themselves to the theory that it doesn't make any difference as long as you're sincere. We have to worship the right object. Our worship must be done in truth. Truth is God's word. By word is truth, Jesus prayed in John 17 and verse 17. And thus, we must worship according to the directions that God has given unto us, or else our worship is worthless. When we insert man's ideas and man's thoughts and man's words instead of God's words, there can be no unity there. Now, we've all, in our preaching, gone through and we've looked at, here's singing. And God authorizes singing. He doesn't authorize simply the making of music. He doesn't authorize simply vocal music. He authorizes one type of vocal music, and that is singing. A lot of, a lot of preachers stop with that vocal music, but that's not correct. It is a specific type of vocal music, and that is singing. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, and many other passages that we see within the New Testament. When we start doing things other than the singing, though, when we start humming, when we start making our voices sound like instrumental music, when we bring in instrumental music, other things like that, we pervert the truth. Our singing is to be in truth. Prayers, that we have congregational prayers in the assembly, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. We're to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, James 5 and verse 16. Again, though, that prayer is to be directed toward the Father. And we'll, in a minute, deal with some other aspects of that. It must also be according to God's will, 1 John 5 and verse 14. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, and Brother West, who just snuck in, uh, had an excellent lesson dealing with the Lord's Supper last night, saying forth the truth, in relationship to the Lord's Supper. That is to be done in remembrance of the Lord's death. That is to be done upon the first day of the week, which means every Sunday. In our giving, that we are to give upon the first day of the week. That while some will want to try and take the giving out of the worship service and say, well, that was a local situation. Well, you in a sense, yes, it was, but there's a reason, a command that lay behind the local situation. And that is, you take up a collection every first day of the week so that when a need arises, you will have the money available to meet that need. And it was something that Paul had commanded already to the churches of Galatia. And what he commanded to the church of Corinth, he had commanded to all churches, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, and 7 and verse 17. So it was a command for us today as well to give upon the first day of the week. And we are to be liberal in our giving. We are to give bountifully. We are to give cheerfully as we have purposed in our heart, not grudgingly or necessity. Then we are to do a preaching, a study of God's Word. Acts 20 and verse 7 again shows that that is an aspect of our worship. And preachers are thus to preach the Word, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2. Not man's think so, and man's ideas, 1 Peter 4 and verse 11. That if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now does that mean that we just get up and start reading the Scriptures and say nothing else? Well, no. I think Nehemiah 8 and verse 8 gives us a great definition of what preaching is all about. When it says, so they read in the book of the law of God distinctly, and they gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. There is that aspect of, yes, reading God's word, 
clearly, definitively, there he is then giving them the sense, explaining it. And then the proper application of that truth to the lives of the people so that they will understand what is being said as far as their own life is concerned. But let me also mention the respect that Israel had for God's word, which is a couple of verses previous to that, in verses 5 and verse 6, that when Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered up, Amen, amen, with lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. There was a respect for that aspect of what we would refer to today as preaching. I think we need to get back to that as well. But then there also needs to be unity in spirit. Spirit refers to man's attitude in our worship. We are to center our minds upon those things that God has authorized in our worship. When we are singing the songs, we are to think about what those songs say, what those songs mean. We are to center our minds on it. That's the idea of making melody in your hearts to the Lord. In our prayers, those who are leading our thoughts in prayers I pray with the Spirit and the understanding, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. The idea of Spirit is one's own attitude and one's own thinking. The idea of understanding is giving understanding to others. Why? So that the individuals, others will be able to say amen at the giving of thanks. What is it? They have to understand. During the Lord's Supper, our minds would be centered upon that great sacrifice that Christ made for us. We are to think of his body and the blood that he shed upon Calvary's tree so that we can have salvation. Our giving as we give and put that money into the collection plate is to be done with proper attitude of mind and heart. We are to give cheerfully, not grudgingly, not of necessity or we're not being forced to, Someone holding a club over your head and saying, you better or else. No, it's because of a desire I want to give. And then in that preaching, there's the aspect of a study of God's Word. That one who is preaching is leading our thoughts in a study of what God says. And we're to make sure that we are centering our minds upon what is being said and comparing it with God's Word and making sure, you know, proving, testing the preacher to make sure that he is of God and not a man. To be like the noble Bereans of old in the searching of the Scriptures to make sure that those things are so. The problem is, so many times, people's attitude or in relationship to the preaching is far different than what it should be. We see individuals, probably all you preachers who have gotten up before, you stand and look out over people. <laughs> now then, or you see people writing notes and passing notes between each other, talking, whispering with each other. Where is our thinking? Where is our mind? our attitude, and our worship. When we have that unity, we're going to be thinking about those things that everyone else is thinking about. That's unity. And when we worship that way, we will have unity. But what happens if someone's mind is not on God's Word? for example, during the preaching. What happens if we're singing these songs and someone's mind wanders? 
Brother Darrell Brokey yesterday mentioned Joshua Day. Brother Day is an instructor at Tri-City School of Preaching. He challenged me for a written debate uh, dealing with Dave Miller's sermon in 1990. I responded that it was making it a stipulation that it be an oral debate, which he refused, and that it be at Stony Creek where he is one of the ministers. Because he would not do a oral debate, and I wasn't going to do a written debate, I asked Brother Daniel Lennon if he would accept the written that debate. And all of this is documented, I think, on the CFTF list, if you want to go there. And so they started negotiating. But in that negotiation, the demands that Brother Denham made that were right was that you also defend the practice at Brown Trail that came from the sermon that Dave Miller preached and that he had to get the elders there at Stony Creek to say that he was basically representing their position. Talks broke down essentially as a result of his unwillingness to defend the practice that came from the sermon that they know were preached. But the argument that he used is what I wanted to draw upon. That's just to give you the background. His excuse was that someone's attitude might not have been right and thus, that would make the action unscriptural. Now then, take that and apply it to our worship, brethren. Here we are and we sang a song, walking. Uh, and name I just left me, one, walking in sunlight. <laughs> isn't that a uh, good illustration now, isn't it? What if? Someone over here, as I was singing over here, but their mind was someplace else. That argument says everyone's worship, because of that one individual's mind wandering, everyone's worship is vain and worthless and unscriptural. During a prayer, Mother Shry led the prayer. If someone's mind wandered to something else, then that made everyone's prayer unscriptural. That's that argument. That is the height of craziness, stupidity. If that's the case, I better stop going to worship. And I better worship by myself, but I better not worship with myself even too long because I know my own mind. We might as well stop worshiping altogether with that type of a argument. That is how foolish that type of argument is when we start applying it that here's someone's attitude makes everything unscriptural. The action. If I have an improper attitude as we sing that song, or as the prayer is being offered, or as one is preaching, that doesn't affect the worship of anyone else other than me. I might have worship unscripturally, but that does not make the action itself unscriptural, in spite of Brother Day's argument. There are going to be hindrances to our worship, though, as far as a corporate aspect. Because when one alters truth in relationship to that worship, then, yes, everyone's worship is going to be altered. For example, singing. In the mid-1800s, some very simply were not satisfied 
with what God had authorized in relationship to our worship to him regarding our singing. And so what did they do? They brought in an instrument of music. Now then this morning when we sang that song, what if somebody over here had started banging away at a piano? That would affect everyone who was singing that song here. If my attitude was wrong, that doesn't affect anyone else. It affects me, but no one else. When you use an instrument, it affects everyone. That becomes a hindrance to our unity in worship. And when something like that takes place, or and we could talk about the group a cappella, the singing group a cappella that is, not our singing of a cappella songs, hymns, and spiritual songs, but that musical group that basically says, well, I'm going to make my voice sound like an instrument. That's going to affect everyone who is involved in that worship. To do those things, and since someone has a, a lesson dealing with singing, and music of the church and unity. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time, but that's going to affect everyone when you change the truth. You change and alter God's work. Additionally, it separates us from God so that we cannot have unity with God. And by nature, it will separate us from all others who do have unity with God. And in that type of a situation, as all of the other things that we're going to be talking about, I have to get out, I have to separate myself from that if I want to continue to have unity with God. If I remain in that, that situation, then my unity with God is severed as well. Prayer. It's the outpouring of our heart to God. It is to be directed to the Father. Matthew 6 and verse 9, as Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven. And John 16, verse 23 and 24, he says that in that day you shall ask me nothing. You are to ask the Father in my name. Our prayers are to be directed to the Father. The Roman Catholic Church brought in the idea of praying to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Brought in praying to Jesus along with the Holy Spirit, along with others. We have some in the Lord's church today who come along and start mimicking them in relationship to praying to Jesus. And I document at least one situation uh, within the Lord's Church as to someone teaching that. Brother Wayne Jackson argues for the appropriateness of it. Others have as well. Brethren, there is no more authority for praying to Jesus as there is to praying to Mary, the mother of Jesus. There is no authority for it. What if someone this morning, as we're standing here and we say, okay, we're going to be led in prayer, and someone comes up and they start addressing their prayer to Jesus. What does that do to all of us? That individual is leading our thoughts in prayer to, well, in prayer to Jesus on this occasion instead of prayer to the Father. It affects everyone's worship, and it separates us from God, and thus, separates us from all of those who are going to hold to the truth. We could also talk about mechanical aids in worship or in prayer. Catholics use the rosary beads. And Buddhists will write their prayers on slips of paper and insert them into a prayer wheel, which is to propel their request up to the far regions of the universe. 
a such as that, again, not authorized by God. But it would affect everyone's worship. Or what if we had a woman come up to lead the prayer? When Paul very clearly teaches, I will therefore that the male pray in every place. Showing that when there are both men and women present, the male, not the female, is to be the one doing the leading in that prayer. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 8. But years ago, a lot of it started with the youth groups and having these chain prayers, and finally in those chain prayers, well, we'll just have the one, uh, we're going around and we're going to have everyone, including the women, involved in this chain prayer. And that's the leading of the chain prayer, and it soon graduated to other places. And now then some are having women in leadership positions totally in the church. But if a woman came up to lead prayer here, number one, it would be stopped immediately by these elders. We know that. But it would affect everyone's worship. It would separate us from God. The Lord suffered because, again, Brother West dealt with that last night. But the elements used, if we change the elements, it is to be unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. What if somebody said, well, I think Coca-Cola would be all right instead of fruit of the vine. And they'd send them, take it around, and you drink Coca-Cola. It affects everyone's worship then. We cannot stay in that type of a situation and remain in faithfulness to God and in fellowship with God. We are to partake every Sunday. You mentioned the uh, Mitchell Hills doing it on Saturday nights now. Where is their authority for it? Well, they want to. The Bible teaches us what the purpose of it is for. And it's not for sex like uh, he read in the branch bullet. The farmer's branch. Those things, though, they affect the worship of everyone, not just the individ one individual who's doing it. Contribution. God commands us to contribute to the treasury of the church. That is to be free will offerings. That is, giving is to be done liberally and not grudgingly, bountifully. Denominational groups have for years, though, Anytime they needed money, let's pass the plate again. Every time we meet, we're going to pass the plate. Monday night, Tuesday night, doesn't matter when. We're going to pass the plate because we need more money or we want more money. When the first day of the week is the day that's authorized by God. Then, maybe because they weren't getting enough money, so they thought, we're going to have some money-raising schemes. If you're a preacher and you get the mail at the building, no doubt you get all of these money-making schemes sent to you. That we can get so much money for your church. Well, they started these money-raising schemes. First, garage sales and bake sales, bazaars, And some, well, the apostate church, even has their bingo, their gambling, in order to raise money for themselves. And sadly, a lot of members of the church have followed suit. When they do that, they affect everyone. Tithing, denominational world can holds to the yeah, tithing, not understanding the distinction between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Tithing was never something that you find within the New Testament. And I do believe that we are under a greater covenant, the New Testament. And our attitude should be a greater attitude in relationship to our money and giving that money to God. 
God doesn't set forth a percentage as to what we are to give today. But some preach and maintain you have to give a tenth or else. Again, these things affect everyone. What about the preaching? Again, we are to preach only God's word. Preach the word, Paul tells Timothy. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all unsuffering and doctrine. Peter says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Paul would tell the Ephesian elders, I am pure from the blood of all men because I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All of God's word needs to be preached, but it needs to be preached and proclaimed. That everything that is essential to man's attaining heaven's home needs to be proclaimed from the pulpit. We have a lot of preachers today who will not stand up and proclaim error, but yet they won't preach all of the truth either. They'll hold back those things that are really applicable to a lot of the individuals within their own congregation because if they preach those things, they'd have those people mad at them and they'd be going to the elders and that preacher might lose his job. Be sent on his way because those elders in many of those congregations are too weak-kneed and spineless to stand up to those sinners and say, you need to get your life right with God. Instead, they'll go to the preacher and say, you need to tone it down. You don't need to preach about those things. We don't need that here. But God's word has to be preached in its purity, its simplicity, and in its fullness. A lot of times, some individuals will get up and they will preach in such a way that nobody will understand them. And when you get through, or they get through, somebody will say, what do you say? I don't know. Neither does he. I've always considered some of the best compliments that I get, those individuals who are very young, who come up and tell me I enjoyed that sermon, or I got something out of it. That means a lot to me. I'm putting it on a level then that they can understand it. People need to understand what God's Word says. And they need to understand it clearly, distinctly. So do the people in the world. They need to hear and they need to know here's what truth is. Here is, for example, the one church and all of these religious groups out here, they are set up in opposition to God's church and they're not going to save a soul. And if you're part of those, you're lost and you need to get right with God. And here's the way in which you get right with God. And it's not just some better felt than told feeling. It is in obedience to the Word of God. We could go through, starting from the first century church, how the people, though, were simply not content to stay with just God's Word. You have the Judaizing teachers, you have the Gnostics in the first century, and you could just continue to trace the history down to what we have today. And today we're seeing a state within the Lord's church where people do not want God's Word. They want their ears tickled. They want to feel good about themselves. And they don't care what God's Word says. You accommodate God's Word to me and my life. Don't make me try and change my ways. Don't try and make me feel bad if I commit sin. Just let me wallow in sin and think I'm going to heaven anyway. 
And so we tone down the message of God's Word so that everybody will feel good and we can all go to hell together and smiling about it until we get there. During the Restoration Movement, it was a cry for God's Word and all of God's Word, and that we can have unity based upon that. When we get up and preach God's Word, and when we accept God's Word, and when we practice that Word, then we can and we will have unity. We'll have unity with God, and we'll have unity with one another. But when someone gets up and starts teaching those doctrines that are contrary to God's Word, we either have to stand up and oppose it, or we have to get out if we want to have fellowship and unity with God. May God ever help us to do those things that are necessary so that we will have first unity with him and then we will have unity with all others who have unity with him.